So we're talking to uh, Dorian Yano, who has written an article for our journal on um, the changing conditions or the evolution of EU conditionality, really, in regard to um, earlier uh, enlargements and how they are reflected in the Western Balkan enlargement uh, today. So what is the main line of evolution you're outlining in your article, Dorian? So the, the uh, idea of taking the research uh, concentrated on the Western Balkan countries uh, comes by the, the chance first that uh, the, those countries gives you to have a, a more deep analysis knowing the, the, the time span that the, this enlargement process is, is taking. And I think uh, that was uh, what perhaps we missed during the enlargement of the uh, Central and Eastern European countries because of the short period of time and perhaps we need to re-evaluate uh, all the theoretical conditions that uh, have influenced EU enlargement. And uh, secondly, it's a, a very pragmatic uh, reason for those countries to see that are on the process when uh, we could uh, give, let's say, also an, an, an answer for those countries to be member of the uh, EU. So my main argument was to contrast a little bit the uh, intergovernmentalist approach uh, towards the con constructivist approach that I think in, in most of the literature on regarding the Central Eastern European countries, uh, we find it uh, obvious that it was like liberal democracy values that uh, put those countries uh, uh, forward in the enlargement process. And I think uh, by sele uh, selecting some of the countries from uh, Western uh, Balkans, uh, through a qualitative comparative analysis, we can see that this is not the main the main reason of uh, the politics of EU enlargement. So what we have to consider now, and I think those countries have shown, it's the member state uh, preferences. I, I mean that that was the main result of the analysis that I got. It's to, to have an additional argument on the uh, member state preferences. And this we can see it uh, uh, especially with regards to EU pre uh, presidencies. And I mean, if we see also it was uh, at the time of German presidency where the, the Balkans got to push forward. It was at the time when uh, Greece presidency, the, the Thessaloniki agenda, and I mean, that was also one of the lo uh, laws of the, the Western Balkans because of the uh, inner uh, situation of the EU. We didn't have a second agenda for the Western Balkans, and that, that for me, it's a, a law's cause because it was Greece and Italy coming, taking the presidency. So I think all you know, this situation uh, gives us two important uh, results. The, the, the first one is that we need really to revisit the politics of EU enlargement in, in basis of theoretical terms and also uh, in the practical terms we have to see how and what may be the conditions that this time uh, matters for the Western Balkans and do not get uh, uh, let's say ready solution of, of the enlargement of the Central Eastern Europe. Your, your first observation that we see a shift from, let's say, a more kind of what is a liberal democratic approach to an uh, intergovernmental approach in many ways, the governments being the key drivers of enlargement or blockers of enlargement. Um, how do you explain this shift? Does this shift have a lot more to do with the EU itself or uh, is it also a response to the particularities of the countries of the Western Balkans? I, I see... Uh, uh as, as a very complex issue. The first one regarding with the member states, we don't have to forget that at the time of uh, Central Eastern Europe, there was all this uh, euphoria of getting Europe together. So, I mean, uh, you could not find uh, Euroscepticism at that time. So that, that was a, a great pillar and a push forward for the countries, which now we, we see that for the uh, rest of the Western Balkans, it has been lost, you know. I mean, they are European countries, but there is not this kind of euphoria to get them mm. faster on the process. And I think also, on, with regards to the member state, uh, to the candidate states, we don't have to forget the conditions on that. And as the process is going uh, uh, longer, you know, like 
now the what what it matters for the, the those countries it's not just uh, just the uh, let's say the essence of the polit uh, of democracy and liberal uh, democracy or uh, market economy now we have entered to the very very technical and uh, specific details i mean that if we compare uh, let's say at that time when the countries of the Central Eastern Europe got the, uh, into this process, you know, uh, the technicalities or the small, very technical things that those countries could not meet were overcome, let's say, by the po political will. And I think in this case, the Western Balkans are facing much more of the of the uh, essence of uh, building uh, states and democracy. So, if we rest on the very specific and the, the, the technicalities of of the process, perhaps we have lost the the more core of what EU uh, EU process is. So, in this case, I would say also that the conditions that the member uh, that the candidate countries has has to be evaluated uh, on, on, on their own. But, but I mean, I'm not for uh, pressing and putting the emphasis, you know, on the very specificities and some uh, technicalities of, of, of an aki or uh, perhaps even a policy and the law because the process first has to build on, on the very uh, fundamentals of, of democracy. And I mean, here I, I have in mind the, the most obvious cases, which is Kosovo and Bosnia. And we can also include Albania, you know, for uh, issues of corruption and justice. So if we, we don't have to, to forget the fundamentals. And then I think uh, if the process goes forward, then those countries will, in a way, comply with the very uh, detailed and the specific laws but I mean the pillars the, the pillars of democracy uh, should should not be taken for granted and I think that may be also the, the push forward of the EU enlargement process so so there are two aspects you're mentioning one is in a certain way the problem of the rise of the kind of bilateral demands of member states and the second one is the kind of the the not seeing the forest for the trees phenomena of getting bogged down in technicalities without understanding the larger picture that these technicalities altogether form uh, a democratic uh, market-based uh, system as a whole. Uh, you are right. I mean, that, that, that are my two, let's say, conclusions that I could derive by, by, by this uh, research paper that but how would you see a way out? I mean, would you see that um, the, the EU should should change its conditions, should lower it con its conditions? I mean, you mentioned, you know, what if uh, you know the, the, the countries uh, don't have to fulfill the, cri the the high level of criteria they are asked to to fulfill now? What is what is a way out of this dilemma you're highlighting in your article? I think that uh, uh, like neglecting everything, if the, those countries haven't done something, that's the danger. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am for uh, a support, you know, for all the reforms, uh, reforms that those countries have done, but uh, let's say the, ca the case of Albania uh, that, that is rejected three uh, times the candidacy. I mean, uh, we, we all know and we agree on the weakest points that Albania has, but uh, that's a reframing. You know, like, if you don't push the, the, the process forward just because some of those uh, criteria are not fulfilled, I, I see that this is a process uh, backward in, instead of pushing it forward. So, I mean, that's maybe my, my suggestion of how to move the, pro the, the, the process forward. The, the best example of the region was the uh, visa liberalization, you know, that was also tangible for the for the citizens and where all the countries I mean it's an example that things can be done mm -hmm. you know like if, if we were very skeptic that none of the we, we know that there is nothing as perfect done on this field right mm -hmm. but at the sense that all this process that those countries are in have made them to move forward even on areas or sectors that they have been very problematic. So I mean, this idea of having all or nothing 
I don't think it's it's the best uh, strategy for for the region. Do you? Um, I mean, you identify kind of key uh, events. You're doing take a lo longitudinal approach in your article. You look over time. Uh, what kind of key breaking points, moments do you identify? I mean, in, in looking back on enlargement, which maybe help us to look in the future. What are these moments when we see these shifts occur? Uh, I mean, the, 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 let's say the decisions or the sub-stages that I call of EU enlargements regards the most uh, formal uh, EU enlargement decisions, you know, like opening or closing the uh, negotiation. I mean, that's a point where I base my, uh, let's say, distinction in the evolution of the probability, let's say, of becoming a member state. And uh, really, I, I, I think that EU enlargement process is it, it, very substantial and it's based on this kind of institutionalization. So wherever we find uh, means to, to, to get uh, the Western Balkans closer, as closer as possible in terms of building uh, institution and, and having uh, common agreements, I think that, that's a step forward on, on the countries. Because that's the way how you make EU an internal, uh, an internal actor, and not just you know a, a, a diplomatic uh, mm -hmm. a foreigner uh, of mm. server, but make it part of the uh, of, of the process. And I think if we see EU integration, um, that's also one of the um, let's say uh, strongest point that has been seen in all the actors that. Uh, before didn't have any, mm, let's say, important role in domestic politics, but through EU process as a whole, they have found ways of how to represent their interests. And I think this is the case also for the Western Balkans, that all the, let's say, the most progressive uh, actors in, in each of the country, you know, could find an, uh, uh, an ally to towards all these reforms that it's needed for the society and the, and the states of the Western Balkans. Yeah, I think you're, you're raising a number of very important points in your article and now in your interview, I mean, which is really about changing fundamentally the way conditionality is operated rather than front-loading it with a lot of conditions uh, and then rewarding them. It's rather a process of engagement, which uh, it doesn't lower the conditions, but just means actually helping to build a constituency which has a self-interest in actually implementing them rather than saying, you know, we don't care who does it as long as it's being done and once you do it, come back to us and we'll continue the conversation, if I understand you right. Yeah, I think that that, that will be the best choice. I mean, a reward for what has been done and I think also the, the rest of the things that uh, are missing, they will get the way through because otherwise uh, it's like uh, all the work, or let's say the part of the work that it is done, it may have a reverse eff effect. And I mean, that's that's not what all of us uh, is looking for. I mean, look at the like the engagement of the um, of the EU today with uh, uh, Pristina and uh, Belgrade. That that was like un unthinkable. Yeah. Like some some years before, but I mean, things can be done. You you can't achieve everything. You know, but I mean, going step by step at the, at the direction where uh, things are going well, why not uh, giving a reward on that? I mean, we, we all agree that those countries need to make significant changes, but I mean, these are very, very difficult. So, like, uh, there is a, a lack of, of also of human resources, you know, like, if those countries are spending are, are doing some uh, strong reforms and very expensive reforms in a sector i mean i think there there should be a, a reward and uh, that's why i bring the, the example of visa liberalization that has a, a very positive uh, effects and i mean that was one of the ways also how to make eu tangible to the citizens that perhaps it's missing let's say or there are some arguments that EU has uh, all this uh, elite base and not uh, base to the citizen. So I mean, there, there, uh, we should see also positive um, examples 
on, on the region and we don't need to be uh, that um, let's say strict on saying uh, that everything should be black or white perhaps we may have a gray zone uh, we, we know all that there is nothing going perfect but at least we can admit in in, in the short period of time you know that there has been progress in, in this region and i think it's it's the duty of all those actors in terms and you that should should recognize it and uh, give a reward to those countries to progress okay dorian thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and uh, and writing the article for us thank you for